All right, welcome athletes, coaches, and pole vault enthusiasts to this installment of the pole vault coaching series. This week we have Becky Holiday, um, and Becky is going to be sharing uh, coaching the female athlete, as well as Kelsey Abbey and Natalie Yu, which are going to be um, sharing some of their insights from their um, their uh, their opportunities or their participation in the pole vault. Um, and so I'm going to pass it over to Becky, and she is going to be leading our conversation tonight. Thank you so much, Becky, for being here. Oh. All right. Um, no, thank you, Joel, for um, doing these videos. Um, I've enjoyed them. I think other people have enjoyed them. Um, it's a nice break from the craziness that, that's going on in the world right now. So um, um, I'm going to kind of dive right in, though, and I'm going to bring on uh, Kelsey Abby, who is an amazing uh, person. She is the, uh, a Canadian Olympian. She made the Rio team. And then I'm also going to bring on one of my athletes that I've been coaching. Because I think you guys read about um, the topic that we're talking about. It's um, how to coach female athletes. But um, the, one of the other topics that I'm going to talk about too, we're going to dive into too, me and Kelsey specifically, is about also how to, co how to talk about um, women and, uh, and weight. How to approach talking about women and their weight. I mean, even males. It's it's an issue it's it should be an important topic in this event so um yeah so let's go ahead and bring on both those athletes um kelsey and natalie hi everyone hello hi okay <laughs> thank you so much for having us i'm i have to admit that i'm a little bit nervous because i feel like this is such a huge topic and i know that all of us really want to do the topic justice so I guess I just want to start by saying um, all that I have to offer is my personal experience and that doesn't apply to everyone, but I know that we're going to be sharing just some things that we've dealt with through our own career, throughout our own careers and, you know, offer some insight into what has worked well for us and maybe where there's some areas for improvement when it comes to coaching female athletes. So I'm excited. Kelsey, you're preaching. Don't worry. This is a super nerve wracking topic because I don't really feel like um, I don't really feel like there's a right or wrong answer. And I have gone back and forth since being asked to talk about this topic. I mean, at first, like my, my feministic personality kind of, kind of came out and I was like, well, at that, there is no difference. But the more I'm talking to people, um, doing my research, I kind of really go back and forth every day. So how do you feel about that? What do you, let me ask you, what do you think the difference is approaching males and females? Um, well, first of all, same as you, my initial reaction was like, no, there shouldn't be a difference. Like I was mad that the question would even be presented. Like <laughs> kind of the whole, I can do whatever guys can do and you should coach me the same and I want to be successful and that should be enough. So go ahead and push me. I'm tough. I can handle it. Um, but the same as you, Becky, the more I think about it the, and the more I kind of, uh, look back on my own experiences, I think there are clear differences when coaching male and female athletes. And the main difference is that we're physiologically different. Like there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. It's, we are different. We have different hormones. Women cycle through a monthly hormonal cycle and men don't. And that in it, in and of itself is enough of a difference to matter. Right. Oh, I, I totally agree. Um, I feel because I was the same, um, and I go and I do. I go back and forth just a little bit still. Um, but the more research I do, I definitely feel the same. Um, what some of your experiences? Um, do you, well. Here's another question. Do you think that it's it, whether or not you coach high school or college or elite? Do you feel like that's maybe one of the biggest differences? Yes, I think after after pondering this topic. The conclusion that I've come to is it's not necessarily about coaching men and women differently. It's about coaching each individual athlete um, mm -hmm. to the ways that best suit them. And that's physically, emotionally, mentally, the whole picture. And I do think that that uh, changes as you go from high school to college to the elite level. I think 
there are conversations that can be had with elite athletes that should never be had with a high school athlete. Right. And I can go ahead and jump right into that. And I know we said we were going to talk about weight and body image, but I mean, that's, that's the thing. Like with a high school athlete, I personally believe you should never be talking about weight. I just don't think that high school athletes are emotionally able to process that. And also it's a time, especially females, where they're going through so much change with their bodies. I mean, they're literally becoming women at that point in time. And to put some sort of pressure on them to try to maintain a certain weight or to even think about their weight, I just don't think is very effective at that level. And I think it does more harm than good. Do you agree or what What do you think? I completely agree. And I feel like as a coach, I've really had to do, um, I guess research, I mean, you research just like coaching athletes, um, you know, but what I have found, and, and not necessarily just what I found, I was listening to a YouTube video that was sent to me by a, a really amazing female coach that I know, her name is Coach uh, Brooke Resnick, she coaches at UofL, she sent me this video and was from the coach that coached the um, UNC women's soccer team for the last 30 years, and his, his advice on coaching women versus men it was about women we we thrive on you needing to build our confidence for some reason <laughs> it's really like you know like we need to hear positive stuff a lot of the time um and then males it's almost it's almost like they need to be brought down to a certain level because like they think that's a lot more than we do. So if you kind of throw the weight issue in there right away, especially in high school, way too young, and even in college, um, mm -hmm. we're still in a vulnerable state. I mean, high school and college, and I'm not saying that it's um, harder for males and females. I just know from my own personal experience, high school was freaking hard. Mm -hmm. it, it was a hard time in my life. And the first couple years of college was really hard too and this event's hard. So if you throw something else out there, like saying, you, maybe we should talk about your weight, what's your body? You know, it's like, it is a part of our sport. That is the unfortunate part, but I feel like you need to wait till a certain time in somebody's career to maybe to talk about it. Um, how, how do you feel for, how do you feel as a coach, maybe they, we, could, we could approach it? Yeah, so I was thinking about this um, at the high school level, and it's, it's interesting because I think a lot of coaches would rather just not deal with it at all. Like they would rather just ignore that women struggle with this and just let's focus on technique and let's focus on coaching. Like, I don't want to have to deal with this, but the reality is if you're ignoring the societal context that women have to exist in, then you're not coaching mm -hmm. in the most effective way. And the more that I talk to other female athletes at whatever level, I mean, I've talked about this issue on my own social media and I always get so much feedback from female athletes at every level being like, oh my gosh, I've struggled with this um, my whole life and I'm still struggling or whatever. And so it is rampant and you can look up statistics on how many female athletes struggle with eating disorders or disordered eating. And if you think that it's not affecting their athletic performance, you're absolutely wrong. So I think I got off topic there with what your question was. Um, oh yeah, so, so what can coaches do? So at the high school, is that what the question was? Sorry. Well, I feel like, you, know, you I love Kelsey, you're amazing, don't worry. Like, I feel like exactly what I'm, I'm what I mean is like, because, okay, say you're a, you're a college coach and I really, I'm, a pre, I'm asking you this because like, I think that I, I, have um just i think what you say and how you say things is so so good it's so good for women to hear it's so good for these male coaches to hear so that's kind of why i'm asking you these hard questions so this mm -hmm. um i you have a college say let me give you an example so say you have a college athlete that has such high potential and she wants to get she wants to get better and maybe if it is as like her her weight is an issue you know mm -hmm. what i do in this event like um, if you're a little bit overweight, it's going to be harder. Yeah. Whoa. So, um, 
I'll share a little bit of a personal story. It's pretty quick. So when I was a freshman, that was the exact situation that I was in. And for whatever reason, I, d I still to this day don't know if this came from my coach or if this truly came from this trainer or who it came from. But basically my athletic trainer approached me one day and told me this story about a hurdler who that used to be on the team and you know, she biked extra after practice every single day. And because she biked extra, she made it to nationals. So I want you to come into the training room and bike extra every day after practice and you can make nationals. And I was like, I'm not an idiot. I understand what you're saying to me. You're telling me that I need to lose weight. And the issue I have with that is I would have much rather have sat down with my coach and like, I don't, I don't know the exact way, right way to approach it. But for me personally, I didn't appreciate leaving that up to me to kind of decipher what that was about. I would have rather had a very direct conversation about, Hey, like, like you said, this is a part of the event. And over the course of these four or five years, your body is going to progress. You're going to get stronger. Um, you're, you, you're going to get leaner. There are some things that you can do over time to work toward body and weight goals that will positively impact your performance. These are the resources we have available to you. We're going to connect you with a dietitian. It's going to be awesome because you're also going to learn how to fuel your body so that you feel good and you have energy. You know, it just, it could be a more forward conversation with professionals. And I think that would be more effective. And I also think at the collegiate level, you have those resources. So there's really no excuse for not doing that. Oh, I, well, and I, I actually, I really, I really like that. Do you, um, so one of the, one of the, the people that I was talking to about this topic was I, I was volunteering at U of L this year and I was coaching with a great, or, or helping out with a great coach named Brooke Resnick. I asked her, I mean, she's been doing this for seven years. She's been coaching for a lot longer. And I specifically talked about this topic. And I think that what, and I'm not saying that your coach, you know, he, he didn't do this, but I could really see what, what I saw from coach as a female coach, she really got to know her athletes very well. And she listened mm -hmm. to what I'm saying, and, you know, she would know the ins and outs of their lifestyle, their life, what's going on. And she used that to help them reach the, you know, their highest potential. And so I feel like, you know, as a male coach, maybe we are, they would be a little nervous to talk to you about that, but if mm -hmm. they just, you know, just talk to you more, get to know you more and listen. And that's hard. I'm not saying that because I think you and I kind of have that same personality. We're, we're strong females. So maybe for male coaches, we are a little bit harder to talk to, but showing yeah. you care about us, like at the end of the day, that is the coach that we want in our corner. I guarantee you, we're going to go out there and put out a fight and perform at the level that you would like us to. So, and especially like, then weight being a part of it. I mean, is that kind of what, you know, it's like maybe your coach is just a little nervous and like, but as yeah. a coach, we learn from our mistakes. Oh my gosh, I'm going to make so many mistakes as a coach and when they keep making them for sure. Um, and, but you just learn from them. I'm sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't, and I don't hold that against like my college coach. I have a great relationship with him to this day. And like, I had a lot of success under him. Um, I just think it's easier looking back. I'm just like, you know, I wish, I wish this would have been a little bit different of a conversation. Um, because five years down the road, that is how it was approached by Tim. When he was my coach, it was, it was just seen as a piece of the puzzle. Like when we did our goal so setting you, for the year. Oh, like that, she means Tim Mack. Tim Mack was your coach while you made that. Yeah. Right. Yes. So I think like recognizing that it's a piece of the puzzle, but not elevating it to a level that it doesn't need to be at. Like, it's really not, it is a very important thing, but if it's coming at the expense of like your energy level and your health, then it has a potential to negatively impact performance. Do you think that's true? Like what has your experience been with that? Oh, I, I, luckily, I mean, that's why I, I brought on other people. I wanted them to share their, their experience of this because, uh, just because you look at me out on the field, you know, I was one, I was a fit girl. I might've looked like a skinny girl, but there was a couple years that 
I wasn't. And I, I wasn't for me. I wasn't for my personal, you know, like what I thought I needed to look like. Um, and anybody that would, that saw that, they would just be like, oh, shut up. You're being stupid. But I wasn't performing better. So I, I definitely knew I had a certain body fat percentage that I needed to be at to perform well. Um, there's no question about it. And it was low. It's a low number. I'm not going to throw it out there because I think it's, everybody's different. Mm -hmm. I agree. And you need to figure out what that number is and what is like, um, that's where you perform better. That's where you feel better. That's where your poles are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that's when you're injury free. Um, yeah. And that as a coach, because I have dealt with that a little bit and I think I learned, I, I did it the wrong way. But even as a female mm -hmm. coach, my first athlete, I did it the wrong way. Like I, I think I was, you know, because it, I'm only four years out of being training as an elite athlete. Um, and I sort of coached how I liked to be coached. And how did you like to be coached? Tough. Actually, I don't envy my coaches at all. I actually apologize on air right now. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, but I made Sorry. a competition. I was a competitor. You know, it's like I was totally a competitor. But um, no, I think you should so that, What's that? That brings up not to like veer away from the body image and, and weight conversation because I do think it's – no, like you're good. And we could go on like all day about it and we'll probably come back to it. So let's, yeah. But, um, I don't know. I think let's talk a little bit about the differences or not in coaching male and female athletes, because I put this out on my Instagram and I was actually like completely blown away by how much engagement I got from people. And I think this topic is just really interesting for athletes and coaches alike, but overwhelmingly people's responded that there is a difference. Um, some people focused on there is an emotional difference and that male coaches should interact with female co female athletes differently than they do with their male athletes. Some people focused on those physiological differences. Some people focused on physical differences. Um, I don't know, like, what do you guys think? It's such a yeah. Um, well, thank you for bringing that on because actually now, Natalie, I want you to, this is the perfect time to bring on Natalie because Natalie um, is still competing. She's training for, I mean, still, she's training for Tokyo. I know you are too, Kelsey, but she's sort of younger. She's closer to that high school age and she's actually had um, a male and a female coach now. So um, let's bring on Natalie. Natalie, I, I want to ask you that question. What do you think the difference is um, of having a male coach or a female coach? Yeah. Um, hi everyone. Um, yeah. So like, oh, I can't. Joel is sorry. that? You're fine. Sorry. I I don't need to see you. I just want to make sure other people can. Yes, we oh. can see her. Yep. Okay. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah. So like Becky said, I've actually had the privilege. I think many, or probably a few pole vaulters have had the experience of having a female pole vault coach. Um, Becky and I have kind of talked about how. Um, there's not just not very many female coaches have who have reached that level, uh, or I guess female pole vaulters who have reached the level now where they can come back and be a coach. Um, and so I feel extremely fortunate that I can be working with Becky. It's been an incredible year working with her. Um, but yeah, so I've had whew, maybe four coaches, four f male coaches, and now one female coach now. Um, and so I think kind of what you guys have touched on earlier. Um, I think the biggest, the biggest um, like factor between a male and, or between a coach and an athlete is just the relationship with them. So it is male and it is female, but um, I think I've had success obviously with both. And the most success I've had with the individual coaches is when I feel I'll touch on the emotional part is when I feel emotionally closest to the coach. So when I know that the coach is. Um, interested in my well-being as just like a person in general on and off the track I think that's when I do the best so for example I talked to Becky after my workouts and she's like okay hey how'd that running workout go how did that weight workout go and um I think that for me that gives me the most confidence because I know that she she cares for me 
And um, so, for example, I mean, when things are going on in life, um, you know, relationship problems or things with family or you're traveling around, she really asks me um, how I'm doing with those and then takes that into consideration into my training. And I think that is um, extremely uh, crucial to my training because I think as females, I don't, I'm obviously I'm speaking for myself, but I think I could speak for most females is that what is happening outside of life is directly going to impact what's happening on the runway. So I don't know, this is my assumption for guys is that sometimes pole vault may, might be more of an escape, but for girls, we kind of just bring everything there. And so um, if you have that open connection and that trust with your coach, the uh you can kind of just share that and then they know what's happening and so if you're having a bad day you can talk about it and not just get down on yourself and um kind of downward spiral and if you talk about it with them that just increases trust and so i think when you can trust your coach outside of life when you go on the runway and they're telling you to go up a pole or you know trust them on this transition or something i think it makes it a lot easier to trust them so um but yeah so i think with regards to having a female coach um, and the difference between a male and female, I think that emotional connection is a lot easier to have with a female because of course the climate that we're living in today, you know, with everything with the Me Too movement, everything with the gymnastics stuff happening, everything with the, the priests and the Catholic church happening, um, as females, we're hyper aware. And as I'm sure male coaches, you guys are, have to be hyper aware as well of every little movement you know i know that i've been training in some gyms now and the male coach uh is just like cannot be in the gym alone with the female or for example um i think may, i think it's changed even since when i was in high school um you could give your coach a hug and it was just like not even thought of and now it's like if you hug your coach it's like what's happening you know or uh for example if my hips are hurting becky can you know, dig your elbow into my hip and it's not weird. And then if a male coach does that, of course it's weird. So I think um, that gives us female athletes a lot more freedom to just not have to worry about those, those lines being crossed, which I think that um, male athletes have had the, they've never had to worry about that. And that's something that's always in the back of our head. So um, I feel very fortunate to have a, a male or a female coach that I don't have to worry about those boundaries. So, yeah. well, I, I like that. Um, that makes, I mean, well, I mean, that worked out to plan. Thank you for making me sound good. Um, no, she's <laughs> amazing, everyone. <laughs> no, but I want, I told her, please be honest. And so, um, honestly, and what you're saying with females, it's almost making it sound like it's a little bit easier to be a female coach, but not necessarily because me being a female coach, I find it that males don't want to listen to me, you know? Right. I, I was talking, I talked to some of the kids at uh, club practice the other night and I was asking them what, like, what do you think the difference is? And um, <laughs> this could be a good thing or a bad thing. But I talked to one of the girls and she was like, well, it's just, you're just not as intimidating. You know, I was teaching her some things, just some technical things. And she was like, you know, if, if Austin would have over here would have said something, I would be so scared and like so intimidated by listening to him. But because it's you, you're, you know, you're bubbly, whatever it's a lot easier. So I think that's, I think that's good in some aspects, but then sometimes when you want to motivate, you know, a big dude or something, you might not have that intimidation factor, which is a little bit frustrating. Yeah. I think it just depends on the athlete. I don't think it's necessarily like male or female because I think like you, Becky, I, I liked to be motivated like in a tough way. Um, Tim was very tough and intense and as a coach and he expected a lot, but I knew that going in. So I appreciated that he would set high expectations and like hold us to those standards and his delivery didn't really bother me for the most part, but I think it bothered a lot of other people. So I think it does come back to like, personalities and like I the reality yes. is like some people are going to click better and some athletes are going to respond better to a different type of coaching i think what a really good coach is able to do is they're allowed they're able to work with a lot of different personalities people 
like Tim Mack and Lawrence Johnson. And he was also able to coach me. And he even said, when I asked him to coach me in 2019, like I've never coached women before. And he figured it out because he can adapt and adjust to the athlete. Right. Um, and I think that that's more important than saying like, I'm going to coach females this way. And, you know, because they're sensitive and they're soft, I can't, I can't be hard on them. And I'm going to coach males like really tough and hard. Um, I just think it depends on the person. Yeah, yeah. I agree. But, that goes back to what you were saying, Becky, about Brooke, the U of L coach, where it's just, I think if you get to know the athlete, that's your best bet on being a good coach of figuring yeah. out how they react to different circumstances. Yeah, that can be hard. I have done, now that I've coached for four years, I have learned every year how to do that better. And that's just because me, uh, I want to I want to be a good coach. And if I had just come in and kept my elite training mentality, I was coaching high schoolers. Like, I, I it, and you know what? It turned out that I actually love it. it, it but every year I think I got a little bit better because just because I was growing as a coach. Um, what I realized at the end of the day, and I think for any level, like you're gonna have to realize like, it's about helping these kids or college kids elite level as a coach, mm -hmm. helping them build character, like helping mm -hmm. them have a That's good experience cool. at Hovel. This is a fun sport. This is an amazing sport. I do not, whatever these kids intentions is, like to coming to practice, they're just trying to get away from home or they want to be the best public that they possibly can be, whatever they mm -hmm. want to do, I want to be there to help them to, to do that. And that takes me reading each athlete. That takes me talking to each athlete. Like, and everybody is enjoying themselves in a, the most wonderful sport. And then if they don't want to pole vault, they can move on to the next sport that they'll be best at. It's as a coach, like, he, and one thing, you know, we all know, and everybody that's listening to this, this video or whatever this is, um, you don't get good at pole vault in a short period of time. You're going to be spending a lot of time with these athletes. Like you need to be making this a good experience for them. You got to get to know them. Like it takes time to develop to being a good pole vaulter. So take time as a coach to help develop that person to be a good person. And they'll, they'll do better for you. Guaranteed. That's <laughs> my experience with my, I have like five coaches that, were completely instrumental to making me the culture that I was. Um, like I, in high school, I, I got a name because they're amazing. Todd Freetag in high school, Rick Baggett, who was a Lionel Striders track club, Mark Vanderbilt, who was a volunteer coach at Oregon, and Dan Paff, who, if you don't know who Dan Paff is, then sorry for you, but look him up. <laughs> <laughs> in track and field, Dan Paff, and then the amazing, Earl Bell, like no, everybody knows Earl Bell. If you don't, then again, sorry for you. You need to look him up, you need to figure that out. You need to visit him because like you were saying, Kelsey, what's interesting is my first, until I went with Earl. So my first 15 years as a pole vaulter, I thought I needed that, um, that harsh coaching mentality for me to get it done. And I go, Earl, Earl's the most humble, like he's talking like he's he's got his elbows up he's got his knees up he's just chilling at practice you <laughs> times and he's just like cool can i can i go up and have a beer now you know and you're just like don't you care don't you care but it's like you know what that is he's just in there and then at the end of the day he's just like you're hard enough on yourself why would i be harder on you mm -hmm. and he said that after like three years being with him the earlism the gems you get after being there forever you gotta stick around to get them. You gotta stick around years to get those pearls and those gems. But like I've had, I've been coached by both, and again I was at different stages um, in my career. So when I was younger, I kind of I really needed that that harsh. Um, mm -hmm. As I was older, maybe maybe that would have been worse for me. Maybe I wouldn't have made that. Maybe Earl read me at that time during 2012 and coached me the way I should be coached. But well, he coached every team, so maybe not. But. Um, that's how I felt. So, um, Natalie, that is really good input on, on what you experienced. Like, I really, I really appreciate you as my athlete. I hope you didn't feel like you had to make me look good, but thank you. Oh, please. Then, no, I, <laughs> it just was true. It, it, you just spoke from the heart, which is what I've been telling you ladies to do. Um, I got 
that advice going into this, but um, I want to open this up to questions. What do you think, Kels? Um, yeah, I think that would be good for sure. So, um, and hopefully we can get. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I um, I want to. Yeah, I want people to you to share your background. What what have you uh, brag about yourself? What have you accomplished as a publisher? Me? Yeah, because we're oh. questions. I want people to um, to listen to us. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I was a 2016 Olympic finalist. I placed top 12 at the Olympics and. Um, two-time world championship qualifier. I've competed on numerous teams for Athletics Canada. Um, in college, I was an NCAA runner-up, multiple-time All-American, Big Ten champion, Big Ten record holder. Um, and in high school, I was a two-time state champion. Fun story, Katie Najat and I actually held the state meet record together one year. We actually got to sign the paper for the state meet record together. So I've known Katie since high school. She's still like a very dear friend of mine. Um, Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. What was the height? Oh my gosh. I think it was like 12, six at the time. Ooh, um, awesome. Which, yeah. And I went over backwards in high school. So I didn't actually learn how to turn until I was probably a freshman in college. And I have had some amazing coaches over the years. Um, my freshman and sophomore year, Dave Bowles actually spent a lot of time with us at IU as a volunteer assistant coach. He was, he placed fourth at the Olympics. Um, Butler would probably know which Olympics. I can't remember if it was 90, I think it was 92 maybe. Um, so phenomenal pole vault knowledge, obviously. And then Tim Mack was also my coach at a point and B Miller was my coach at a point. And, um, I worked with my friend, Jeff Cooper. I've been able to spend time with Becky. So I just feel like I've been, I've been lucky to come into contact with people who have done great things in the sport. Um, so that's kind of me in a nutshell. I love it. Um, wise. Yeah, we actually kind of have very similar careers because I was the same. I mean, I, I made the Olympic final. You said what place did you get? You got I got twelfth. I think what'd you get? Eighth? Or... Nine. Nine. Oh. Um, no, we made it in the final. I was a part of the, the big stage like you were. That was that was the dream like come true for sure. But mm -hmm. um again I pulled it for twenty years and I had a really long career, no question about it. I got I made I competed in I twenty nine US championships. Um Holy cow. That's it. That's including indoor and outdoor and four Olympic trials. I think I saw like Rick Sherrod posted that Jen had competed in 26 and I was like, got you, 29. Oh Not my gosh. Competing. <laughs> but um, I'll hold that to her because uh, guess what? I never won one. But I would hold a lot of seconds, a lot of thirds, but that's okay. And I made, um, and then between those years, out of those US championships, I was lucky enough to make um, nine US teams. Well, as far as like um, won the Olympic team, two world teams, world university team, continental cups, um, like NACAX, like decanation. So representing the U.S. nine times within that. She's um, a legend. Like, uh, what's that? I said, <laughs> you're a legend. Oh, oh. Well, we had to brag about ourselves to people who listen. Otherwise, people don't listen to us. See, sometimes these males, like, they, you know, like, just kidding. Sorry, I'm not yeah. I'm not at all. Like, um, but as, I, um, you just throw it out there. I feel like really we should be proud of what we've done and yeah. we don't necessarily talk about it too much. So, um, but anyways, Joel, let's, let's open it up to questions for sure. I want to read one thing really quick because Absolutely. I thought I posted, if you want to see people's responses, um, about this topic, you can go to my Instagram and I put it on the highlight reel because there were some really great responses, but Katarina actually had quite a bit to say on the topic. Um, She's a gold medalist. Like, obviously, she's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, I would love to hear more about what she has to say about this. But she said, um, I don't believe there's a great coach. I asked the question of what makes a great coach. And she said, I don't believe there is a great coach. I think the most knowledgeable coach can ruin athletes, and the least knowledgeable coach can have athletes succeed. Okay. I think what needs to be great is the chemistry and relationship between between the two of them. That includes type of coaching, technique. Um, does it fit the talents of the athlete, physical training? Um, and sorry, I lost where I was at. Um, and training mindset. If you fall, if the coach follows one model of training and technique, 
are they willing to study and learn new things for athletes that won't fit this model? I thought that was good feedback. That's really um, good. Oh, Kat. The times I've talked to her too, I love picking your brain. She's probably so sick of fucking cobalt sometimes, but I, I try to pick her brain too because yeah. she's been in the game a long time and she's gold medalist, no big deal. But um, yeah. maybe she wasn't, she's still amazing, amazing person, amazing. Uh, yeah. Person. She's been the most consistent. She also, she also mentioned that she felt like female athletes um, were actually more coachable than male athletes because I, I think in a, in a way she said that they're more eager to please, like they want to do what the coach wants them to do. And if you can, I, I think you can use that in a positive way as a coach. Um, if you communicate what you want your athlete to do in a positive way, a female wants to do it. Like they're there because they want to get better. Like they're eager for you to tell them like, how do I do it? So I think sometimes coaches can, can kind of ruin that by being so hard on female athletes. Oh, I agree. I, yeah. I think the reason why there's going to be more female vaulters in the U S and there are male vaulters here soon. I think it's pretty even right now. And we've only been pole vaulting for 25 years and I think we're going to surpass the number of male pole vaulters very easily because we we're willing to kind of put in that extra work a little bit. And, and there are males that are, but I feel like the ones mm -hmm. I've, now I've experienced, you know, the, these, these boys are just like, well, I can just grip up six inches and I'm going to go six inches higher, right? No, don't do that. Okay, no, they're going to do it anyways, you know, stuff like that. Girls, like, well, wait, how do I do this? What kind of stuff can I do to get better? What do I need? So I totally mm -hmm. agree. And please thank Kat for that because I felt like that was really, really good insight too. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. So, Joel, how about it? Yes. Um, yeah. So we have a couple questions. Um, one is going to be technically... Uh, for female vaulters, do you feel that there is a difference technically in coaching or technically in coaching the female uh, athlete versus a male athlete or in the technical aspects of the jump itself? Do you feel there's differences? Um, because many of you had male vaulters, I believe, or male coaches, I believe many of you are probably taught a male model, a technical model. But as you've grown through the process of um, becoming very successful, do you feel there's technically some things that um, are different for males and females? Um, what do you think, Kels? No, I want your thoughts on this. You're the technical <laughs> expert. <laughs> well, you're so, uh, we both both did almost the same height, silly. It just was a lot shorter, gripping a lot lower. So yeah. Uh, it's I, and I, well, I mean, the, the first thing is speed and strength girls. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have as much speed and strength, but we're obviously not getting on as big as poles. I think, um, no, I don't, I don't think you should coach a different model. Um, I think you should always coach the pole vaulter. Um, each pole vaulter I have coached very differently. So if you're listening to me during practice, I could be telling one athlete, uh, and it could be male or female, something, and then I could be telling the next athlete something completely different, and that athlete listening would be like, wait, but you told me not to do that. I'm like, yeah, you guys were, you know, everybody's different. Um, I, 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 I was pretty, I was a pretty good pole vaulter. I mean, and I'll, I'll say in the words of, like, Jacob Holler, he's like, you can pole vault the crap out of some pole vault. Like, <laughs> because I think it all comes down to figuring out how to hit a pole. I think in, in, whether or not you're coaching any male or female or any model, you got to teach that kid how to come down the runway. That's how I coach. I coach not one model. I coach how to come down the runway, what you're looking at, what you're looking at the box, you're looking at the pole, you're setting that up because you can look at somebody from the side all day long telling them how something should look. But I, I know exactly what it looks like coming down that runway with that pole in my hand. That's how I coach. So, and that can be hard for pole or for coaches that haven't pole vaulted, but, um, no, sorry, Joel. I don't. I don't think that there would be a different. I think coach um, learn how to vault like the males because they're they're vaulting over their grip, and we as females should strive to vault over our grip as well. If you want to be an elite pole vaulter, you've got to vault two two and a half feet over your grip. Figure out how to do that as a male. Figure out how to vault three to five feet over your grip. That's it. Figure out how to do that. No model anything. Just figure out how to do that. That's it. And that's not easy, but. That's kind of what I think. What do you think, Kels? I agree with everything that you said, totally, 100%. Um, 
Yeah. Right. So you mentioned you mentioned strength a little bit, um, and flexibility kind of fits into that as well. Are there there are there maybe deficiencies that females have or advantages that females have over male vaulters in terms of designing training um, to get them to jump than the technically the same model? Uh, are there certain things that maybe uh, female vaulters need to focus on a little bit more um, or less depending upon um, um and that's a very yeah. general comment that's a really good question and sorry Kels, I, I was gonna, gonna kind of say like what i think i think that um females generally need to get stronger um we a guy can go up on a pull-up bar do do five pull-ups or ten pull-ups very easily or you can do five or ten booth cuts super easy and girl gets up there they can't do that you need that to pull bowl. But um, a girl could be a little bit, have a little bit better body awareness, so she's not going to need as much gymnastics work. That guy needs that that ability to have more of that fluid, flexible, elastic, like Dave always talks about, more of that stretch at the takeoff. And you've got to be able to do that, so you need more of a gymnastics background. I don't really care if you can go do a one-arm pull-up. You can't freaking hit a pole at that stretch. You're not doing you're not getting anything out of it. So, but a girl, she's can't do a pull up you're not going to be able to pull bowl either so definitely training them different absolutely i talk to natalie about that with some of my athletes like i i as a pole vaulter um trained way different than the males that i always trained with i wanted i wanted to be stronger than them and have the gymnastics background that i had um and i kind of kept training a little bit harder through the whole season summer season because i feel like females we can get out of shape a little bit easier than the guys can we don't have, like you were talking about, Kelsey, we don't have those hormones. We don't have an amazing testosterone. Mm -hmm. We don't hold on to that muscle as much. Like, we've got to keep that training. And that, that can be tricky for a coach. You don't want to overtrain somebody, but you want to maintain that strength that whole season. So, yeah. That's definitely, so is that what you, you said? You feel like you, you, feel like yeah, you I, trained that? I think that's true, but, you know, I've never been trained differently than the guys in my group. So, it, I would be curious to see, you know, what would happen if, if I had a training plan that was more geared toward a female. And I think there's probably more research that needs to be done on the topic. Honestly, I think that's true. A, yeah. a lot of research that's done is done on males. So I think there's a lot to be had in that space. Um, so, and also like how performance is affected at different parts of a cycle, a female cycle. I'm, curious about that i'm like why is there not more research on this um i mean i know we like how I coach, like leave us alone i'm not motivated this week i can't even come to pole practice that's seriously yeah. what I, it sucks because if it falls on a yeah. big competition if it falls on a big like u.s champ or something like that i was always that's, that's something we have to deal with it's really yeah it's, I mean, that's no, i agree with that that's definitely a hard one but Something. Definitely like the psychological effects too. And like energy, I know before my period, sorry to just be like blunt about it. Like I'm really tired, like extremely worn out and, um, psychologically I can't handle as much. Um, and sometimes I'm and that's crazy. Usually I'm like, like you cannot get in my way. I want, but I've been on the runway and I'm just like, like noticing flies pass by. It's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, oh. it is. Oh. It's just something to be aware of as a coach and like just be approachable so that you at the very least your athletes can tell you like it's not a good time of the month. And I've said that before to my coaches. I've just been, you know, it's like, what's wrong with you today? Well, it's just, it's hormones. So sorry. And you I know, the thing is like, cause I've said that to a coach and he, he said, he's like gross. I sucked to that day. That sucked. And like, this wasn't one of the five coaches that I mentioned. This I wasn't with him for very long. When he said that, that's not listening to me. That's just basically you said, yeah, I get that. This isn't an easy topic for guys to talk about. No question about that. But when his comment was yeah. like, close, like, that's not helpful. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think, like, I think the appropriate, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think the appropriate response would be like, okay, you're feeling fatigued. What can we get done today? Like, that's what a good coach would do. Like, okay, psychologically, like you're drained, you can't get on your biggest pole and you're struggling with running through. Like, why don't we do takeoff drills? Let's do something today. 
we just don't have to do like yeah yeah so that's in my take. high school in high school you probably don't want to be like you said where we were we've been at the elite level and the quad level for a long time in high school like that's something not really i wouldn't even talk about that with my female athletes because i I yeah i agree yeah totally yeah, I mean, everybody's you know take this with all everything which is more of like the elites but uh, i totally agree thanks so um what else joel great um that was actually the question that I wanted to ask was, um, and, and so I'm going to ask a question that kind of segues off of that. And, and you kind of alluded to it a little bit of, um, you know, if there is a competition or a some type, probably, yeah, a competition on a day where um, you aren't feeling the best and, and it is that time of the cycle, how did you, how did you did you just buck up and deal with it? Like what, do you have any coping mechanisms um, or things, advice to offer young female athletes um, that might be listening? I love that. How about you, Kelsey? I'm still working on it. <laughs> um, I do think a really simple thing female athletes can do first is track your cycle. There's a ton of apps. So just so you can at least see when things are happening so you're aware. Um, and then, I mean, from there, there's very basic things like good nutrition, coming back to that helps you have energy during your cycle. Um, definitely reach out to a dietitian about that and figure out what foods can I be eating to like really help me through that part of my cycle. Simple things like drinking enough water and making sure you're hydrated, get extra sleep. If you are able to take a nap during the day because your training allows you to, get that extra sleep. Like those are things that work for me, like really basic things. Yeah, uh, I agree it's completely. And you know what, there's things that are as athletes in general for all of us that are completely out of our control. And now mm -hmm. that's one of them. And as an athlete, the older that I got, um, recognizing that and just trying to focus on the things that I could control, just like you said, the nutrition aspect. Um, drinking more water, staying hydrated, eating healthy, um, you know, like stuff like that. So for sure, that's really good advice. So as yeah. a, sorry, as a male coach, high school coach, mm -hmm. um, and Becky, you mentioned, you know, that wouldn't be something that you even as a female would be comfortable probably having that conversation with, with your female athletes. Um, would it be, you, what I'm hearing you say is it may be best to um, offer some general things about uh, nutrition, rest, hydration, um, to really make them aware of that and the benefits that it could provide them during those, those times or overall, I guess yeah. it's important always. Yeah. I think like as the coach, you kind of just got to know where your expertise is and it's not that. So I think it's, it could be very simple, like have a dietitian in your area come in and talk to the whole team together. Like don't single anyone out. doesn't have to be male, female, just giving some like really basic good guidelines um, and just start there because I think that, I think that's the best way to approach it as a coach in high school. Uh, that's good advice. Yeah. Bring in help, bring in a female perspective, bring in, I'm not necessarily saying a dietitian is female, but um, I think making athletes at that age feel comfortable because it's just not an issue that's addressed necessarily and especially in a sport. So address that as a group. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, I think it's, you know, I, I like to tell my, my, my students as a, as a biology teacher, I'm comfortable with those conversations. Um, but, but my wife is a, a nurse practitioner in women's health. Mm -hmm. So she and I have these conversations on the regular um, with that. But yes, absolutely bring in help. Um, yeah. Find someone that you can connect with that can that can have that conversation and be comfortable having that conversation because oh, it's yeah. definitely a game changer. Oh, it um, can be. But it sounds like in your family, all those conversations, you know, are pretty open um, and uh, not by fault of his own, but I, I – that way in high school, that would have not been a comfortable topic for me at all because I just grew up with my dad. I lost my mom when I was 10. So, you know, this topic was very hard for me. You know, it was just like, and 
if I think if a coach did kind of talk about it, but if you brought that in as a group, like Kelsey had mentioned, that would have been different. I said the 90 versus now, like anything, we're always evolving. Back then, it was totally different. So um, mm-hmm. I think now it's a little bit easier to talk about things like that, I, as it is now, and I'm older now. Yeah. That's too- <laughs> Like, like everything, everything's changed in my life completely. So like, including just like sweating more. Maybe I'm just like, you're so hot after baby. Sorry, your wife will know this. It's just hot <laughs> all the time. It's really awesome. <laughs> so on that same topic, um, before we move to a different question off this topic, um, what, when do you feel is the appropriate age to have that conversation um, with your athletes? Um, I know you said at the elite level, that's definitely something that's that needs to be considered. But is that early college that that might be happening? Does it p- depend on the relationship with the coach and the athlete? Um, what are your thoughts? I think in, I think elite level, it's okay to approach it as a coach. I think in college, wait for that athlete to talk to you first about it. Mm-hmm. And in high school, like make it more of the group area situation. That would be my advice. What about you, Kels? What do you think? Yeah, I think that's good advice. And I think that would be the same advice I have for really any topic that's sensitive. Um, High school level, approach it as a group. College, wait for the athlete to approach you. And I think the elite level, there can be a more open conversation. Yeah, well, there has to be. I think that's fair. Yeah, there has to be. They'll, and they'll want to talk about it if they want to get better. So, yeah. Definitely. I like it. Um, yeah. So we have a question from the YouTube um, channel uh, that wants to know a little bit about more about your background. Um, they say uh, they've been back and forth and thinking that gymnasts made the best vaulters. What has been your early background experience? Um, were you all ex gymnasts uh, of the elites that you know on the circuit still today? You know, were they all gymnasts that kind of worked this way over? What is your uh, thoughts on that? Um, Kels, what do you? What's been your experience? I mean, I was a highly competitive gymnast all growing up, um, but I also played like almost every other sport too. I played four sports in high school, so I really only pole vaulted like a couple months out of the year. Um, I think that the sport is trending away from the gymnastics type. Um, (laughs) B. Miller said gymnasts that can run. (laughs) Yeah, that is a great thought. Um, I think it's good to have a gymnastics background, but I do think that the women who are at the top, top right now, a lot of them didn't have a gymnastics background. I think like Katie's my friend. So she's an example I can use. I, I know she had a small amount but she wasn't like competitive into gymnastics like I was and yeah I mean part of being able to be a competitive gymnast lends itself to like a shorter body type and that's not a great characteristic to have as a female pole vaulter so I think we're trending away from that in the sport I totally agree I mean Jen sure she wasn't a gymnast she was just tight right and she's dominated the women's pool. She dominated the women's pool as long as I was competing. Yeah. Still is. And she was, you know, not short like I was. I'd stand next to her in warm up, and I was like, I had a big pool you got there. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, like, I, I see, I know Sandy, like, maybe started doing a little bit gymnast- of gymnastics, like, this year. And she was kind of, like, making fun of herself. Like, I, she can't even really do a cartwheel, I don't think. But she's yeah. obviously phenomenal she's jumped five meters so um yeah. i think yeah. that she's, she's trying to do that for me she's trying to do that cartwheel i think you have to but i think gymnastics is a huge training tool yeah do so um you can develop it even a later stage like i think you can develop gymnastics abilities i don't necessarily know how old i mentioned that hand-eye coordination can be developed that's somewhat i've noticed from coaching kids but don't you just work with what you've got sometimes always just try to make it fun and you just but you can get stronger i always tell my athletes like generally and especially right now with quarantine that was going on and nobody can go to tracks or anything but right now it's a time to get faster and stronger and guaranteed if you do that then when you come back from this things that you couldn't fix you'll be able to fix them 
Mm -hmm. Things in general will make you stronger, no doubt, upper body wise. Like when we leave the ground, and this is what probably people hear, Joel, is a lot of the time is when you leave the ground, we are gymnasts. Mm -hmm. so we, hand, we become gymnasts. We're, we're inverting just as fast as the gym is doing, trying to do that for the hip hand. We're inverting that fast. So that's why they, that gymnastics background is essential. Me and Kelsey, we're really lucky that we did have it because it does yeah. ask your question. But it also, of the 20 year career that I had, it took me 10 years to learn how to freaking run. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's, that's my weakness too. So, but I, one thing, I didn't do gymnastics at all in college. And so when I moved to Knoxville and started training with Tim, it was kind of like I was reintroduced to gymnastics and we had specific exercises and a specific routine we were following. And one thing that's really cool about gymnastics is when you start out, you are horrible. Like you can't, like you said, you can't rep out 10 pull-ups. And so I think as coaches, if you're looking for a way to um, increase confidence in your athletes, not on the track, do it through gymnastics and do it over time. Because I know like my first two years with Tim, my confidence like skyrocketed because I got to see the progression of, oh my gosh, like I couldn't do this skill four months ago. And now I'm freaking repping it out and it's easy. So that's something to think about. I think anytime you can, you can find a sneaky way to build confidence in your athletes. It's a good yeah. thing. Well, it's always getting back to building confidence. And that's for any pool if you want to build confidence. But us females, like, and I'm not trying to generalize this at all, but um, we do lack confidence sometimes in ourselves. And I don't know why. And I feel like that would be the difference. So building that confidence in any way that you possibly can. So kudos to Tim. I feel like that was really good. So, mm -hmm. For sure. Excellent. Um, I'm going to go back to some things that you mentioned um, at the beginning. And one of the things was the idea of, you know, good coaches make connections. <clears throat> they connect with their athletes. Um, how can maybe provide an example? Um, I know everybody's different and, and each coach has to develop their own set of tools in a way to connect uh, with athletes. But um, can you think of an example in which a coach um, you felt really did something that made you f feel like they cared or connected with you that really was something that that kind of established that that connection what do you think Kels? that's just a really hard question because there's so many things um and i don't have like a specific example do you becky well, i have two actually um and so I have to go, we're going to talk about, because the only thing I can talk about, Joel, is kind of like a personal experience. Yep. And I want everybody to take this. Remember, this is 20 years ago. So this was a long time ago. And I, <clears throat> I kind of had a different route as far as going from high school to college. I went to community college. Um, and I went to a community college called Clackamas Community College, where Rick Baggett coached there. He runs Willamette Striders Track Club. And my first year at the junior college, um, the community college, I was still just kind of struggling in life. <laughs> like I, I was making wrong decisions. I was hanging around the bad, a bad crowd and Rick never gave me crap for that. He just coached me. He's a great co And, but the summer in between that first and second year of community college, um, and it, and it wasn't that I couldn't go home. I just didn't want to, um, my father, is such an amazing parent in the way that he parented me. He is a very strict, like military loving dad as he is where I, we just didn't have that type of relationship where I felt like I really wanted to go home. So I felt like I had no money. I was very much like making the wrong choices. Well, Rick Baggett at the time gave me, he, he gave me a job. He let me paint his house that summer. And, um, and he let me clean his house. And then he actually let me down on his property down the road, let me live in a shed. On his property and that's like <laughs> something nowadays i don't think would be like necessarily like you know something you should do but um here's what happened that summer you know i made a little bit of cash painting his house which he actually probably had to pay double to have somebody paint it again because i did a freaking terrible <laughs> and but this next year um i went from an 11 6 pole vaulter to a 14 4 foot pole vaulter that like just gave me a lump in my throat. 
I'm gonna cry. It was just, you know, like, I, I went, and I didn't even realize this until this, I was being asked to do this, whole, this presentation because, you know, it's like at the time I didn't even really think about it, but I was like, wow, that, that, that kindness that that coach showed me, and maybe he just enjoyed my, he liked me. I don't know if he saw that potential in me, but um, he gave me, um, or he showed me that he cared. And then the next year I had that coach in my corner. Um, and so, but anyways, that I'll, I'll leave it with that example. The next example is kind of a long story too. So Joel, I want to answer another question. That, no. that, that to me, the best example of a coach showing that they cared for me. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's, you know, the main part there that I want to drive home is, um, you know, really showing that you, that you care. That's the number one. And that care, that caring is the key to opening up potential. Um, and mm -hmm. so if we can, if we can really focus on caring for the person, um, not even the athlete, just care for the person, then we, we can open up the door to potential. Um, and it's mm -hmm. not something that you just do um, every once in a while, it's something that you're, you're continually fostering that caring, uh, relationship for the athlete and not just one of them, not the best kid on the team, but the entire pole vault crew, if you have a, you know, 15, 20 of them or whatever it is, um, so that they, they all have that equal, um, opportunity. Um, we're going to move on to the next question, which is, um, what advice would you give a young vaulter, um, what would, what would you tell them, um, how do I want to say this, knowing what you know now, what would you tell yourself uh, as a young vaulter, hmm. a young female vaulter even? Dude, I, I, all right, Kels, this is all you, I'll have to think, that's a good question, Joel, so go ahead, Kels, what do you think? I mean, there's a lot of things, but um personally for me the biggest thing that i feel like has inhibited my progression in the sport and my ability to stay healthy is my negative body image and really overthinking my weight and the food i was eating and i don't have an answer of like why i am that way or an exact date of when that started, but I feel like I've struggled with it since I was 15 years old. And so if I could go back and tell myself anything, I would say, Kelsey, you're going to be in this sport for another 10 years plus, and you would be much better off if you would just allow yourself to progress slowly over time and just take each day as it comes. You would be much better off if you just focused on um, treating your body with respect and eating to nourish yourself. Like that is what is going to allow you to have longevity and health in the sport. So I know I'm not alone in that. And that's why I am so passionate in talking about it because there are so many female athletes who have struggled with that. I mean, Molly Sidell, I just listened to a podcast with her. She won the US marathon trials. She's going to the Olympics for the US in 2021 or whatever, whenever it happens she had an eating disorder and had to step away from sport and get healthy. And then she came back and freaking wins the U S Olympic trials. Like that's a thing. Like it's, it's rampant in our sport. And yeah, that's what I would tell myself is to not focus on that so much. I wholeheartedly agree with you. And obviously like, I think I'm about 10 years older than you, Kels. And I don't, I don't, and the, um, because the first half of my career, we didn't have social media. And so the last 10 years of my career, we did, but I wasn't really involved with it. You know, I feel like mm -hmm. a lot of, or a lot of these kids these days compare themselves to people. Got a camera everywhere. We have picture, pictures up everywhere. Like, thank God, like I didn't compare. I didn't have that because I was a stupid idiot in those, that, first year I was talking about my junior college where I got those awesome those awesome tattoos my quintessential <laughs> camp I got back there hated it finally got a room but it was just like I'm so glad we didn't have social media but the kids have that these days and it's not going away anytime soon but as coaches you, if you can see a kid's down it might be because they were looking online seeing things comparing themselves to other people because that's 
it's really hard not to do. Yeah, I mean, women, well, I guess athletes in general, people in general, but women especially already compare themselves to everyone else, like in person. And then you add on, like you have no break from it because it's 24 seven, so it's a lot. Wearing a lot of clothes out there. It's, you see that on, on a kitchen? Yeah, I can pick apart, you can pick apart. Yeah. Okay, so, I that sorry. sorry, I was going to say, so as a coach, um, we circling back a little bit back to the beginning, but, but, uh, advice for coaches in body image, um, more so like not necessarily what not to say or what to say, but like, mm-hmm. re- do you, do you have any, know of any resources or other things that maybe maybe uh, they could, coaches could access to help with this conversation. Um, yeah, so the conversation is a hard one and as far as just like getting people, maybe not to compare themselves, that's different, but as far as just having a healthy lifestyle, Coach Pat, Dan Pat, I talked about him earlier in the way that he sort of had us athletes in general and he had a lot of male and female athletes that in general, we, if you want to succeed in this, sport you just have to be a healthy person you have to eat healthy so he would approach it as saying like he would give us ideas and he would call it the anti-inflammatory diet and we all know inflammation causes injury it causes injury so he would approach it to, as a coach saying if you want to be a good athlete then you need to have a healthy lifestyle and this is the anti-inflammatory way of doing it he always you know so um the resources are out there for sure and um online these days so you can find well i, I guess i really don't know if they're there's good dietitians. Um, Kelsey, do you have any advice? Did you have a good dietitian that you worked with? Like, I have an amazing dietitian I can recommend to anyone. So I'm happy to pass that info along if if, if anybody wants it. Um, you can literally Google like how to talk to female athletes about weight. Like, there's some people who have like written thesis, whatever a thesis on this topic. Like, there is good information out there. Um, but again, I think it all comes back to seeing an athlete as a whole person. And I think one of the things that I appreciated most was when my coaches would express to me verbally that they were proud of like my effort or I'm really proud of like your resilience. That's amazing. Like you've been through a lot and you've been so resilient. Like that resilient you're so tough like I think there's ways you can focus on other things instead of like always focusing on performance and always focusing on somebody's body and I think that's very important for high school athletes so Next. hard because that stupid rule of having to be under your weight for, for girls I think that was around when I was oh. there. I not believe that it's still there I can't I like I can't like I mean, if I had known in high school how easy it is to take off the label and put another one back on, I would have done that. So, <laughs> yeah, we're not we're like, not recommending that. We're not. I would, yeah, <laughs> if I were coaching, I'd probably like tape all the labels and just <laughs> not tell an athlete. You have to get on a scale. How horrible is that? Like, that's so. I mean, luckily I wasn't one of those girls that necessarily in high school and college a little bit. But this is a sport where weight in in a lot of sports is. We're, we're a sport that weight is an issue and it's, it's really tricky. It's really hard. Um, mm-hmm. but, but we're not saying it's not a part of the sport because it is, yeah. and it is important. Yeah, no, I, that's what I was saying. You for sure. So, um, but always keep learning about it. And Kelsey, you're saying that you have, um, a, 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 um, but you have a dietitian that you would recommend. I'm mm-hmm. available. Like anybody that's listening to this, I think Kelsey is the same where we are always willing to help out anybody that kind of has questions. If you wanted to like DM us on Instagram or Facebook, like we, I think all of us love this event. We love talking to them. We love helping out in any way that we possibly can. So I'm always going mm-hmm. to help specific, more, more specific questions on this. So also kudos to everyone who's on this and like is trying to learn more and better themselves as coaches. I think that's awesome. Like, yeah. I mean, it's a weird topic, how to coach females better. And there's like, you know, I, it, it was such a hard topic when they talked about it. We did it, we've approached it in Reno a couple of years ago. And since it is kind of a new topic, because a lot of us um, elite, female elites are now retiring. So now, now there's a, there's a, a 
transition from us becoming coaches. And mm -hmm. I, I hope that we become an asset to, you know, in this amazing global world. So, um, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dave Butler, for asking me to do this, like, and Joel for doing this. Like, well, I wanted to ask uh, Kelsey and Becky as well here to, if if you wouldn't mind, and not to, I know that someone might get left off, but if you, if there was any female coaches that you could name drop as resources out there that that you know for anyone watching this that's looking for a female coach to connect with, uh, whether it's around technical stuff, but also just just being a pole vaulter um, as a female. Uh, do you have any any names? I know you named Brooke at Louisville already. Really Jenny um, Ashcroft. Jenny, Jenny Ashcroft. Yeah, it's awesome. Stacy's doing uh, tremendous things. We don't know Stacy. She did this, so we already we already don't even need to mention Stacy because she's Stacy and amazing. Yeah. Uh, but um, there's another coach down in Texas. Brooke is, has a club. Um, I can't remember the name of the club or. Brooke Demo, um, or sorry, Brooklyn. Let me see. Brooklyn Dixon. Yeah. Yeah, my my Canadian teammate Annika coaches a lot of high school kids. I'm sure she would be happy to talk to people as well. Yeah. Um, that's so. We're out there. Um, April Steiner. Holy moly! I almost forgot that lady. Love her. She just put a pool in her backyard. So if you live in the Fayetteville, Arkansas area, give her a call. She's awesome. Um, Erica Fraley. Someone said that. Yeah. Yes. She used to be in Oklahoma, but now her and her husband, Doug Bailey, they live and coach at Washington State. So we're out there. And, I, you know, I've been very fortunate to be able to coach and now coach at the high school level. And it was really cool to hear some of the high school parents come up and, you know, say, hey, we – maybe they're just happy, but they were just saying for their 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 children, whether it's boys or girls, they're just like, we're just, we just really enjoy them having a strong uh, female role model. You know, it's like, and so, but I, I just think hopefully there'll be more female coaches and I, there are going to be inevitably, um, I'm throwing this out there, just sort of putting this tidbit out there, but, um, how about, uh, Greg Cole, I don't know if you're still listening, you're probably still listening with your, um, RBF case right now. <laughs> Good one. So just kidding, Greg. Another <laughs> coach has been amazing with females because he's listened to my problems too. So when he coached me, but, um. How about it? The Reno and Reno have a keynote keynote speaker, female out there. I think that would be, we've never had that. So I think that's a great idea. Yeah, they're just saying, but, um, um, so what, anything else, Joel? Anything? Well, I just wanted to also chime in on that, that piece that you just mentioned, you know, um, just rattling off names and, and the idea, one of the things that was kind of the the foundation of this pole vault coaching series was that pole vaulters are the pole vault community is a community that's so willing to, um, to share and collaborate. And so that, uh, you don't need to be afraid to ask people, um, for help. Um, whether no. you're a male, female coach, athlete, other things, there's always someone out there. Uh, a lot of the people that I've reached out to, um, actually, I've never had anybody turn me down to speak on this. So um, that just shows the strength of the pole vault community. So um, yeah, awesome stuff. Well, I love it. I mean, I think there's a lot of people out there that we all want to be better coaches. I hope because we make mistakes all the time. And I feel like this is such a good, a good start to this is this an educational series. It's not how to be a better coach to making people better pole vaulters, but making them better people. And it's, who knows? Maybe it'll help get away of that stupid box collar. Just kidding. Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> That's a different topic or different but, different yeah, session. It's about educating. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, so yeah, that's that is um, the. I don't have any other questions um, that have that have come in, um, and we've been rolling for about an hour and fifteen minutes. So dang, um, we're you know once we get going, it it can just time can kind of fly by. So I want to, I want to just quickly uh, wrap it up here and thank everyone for joining in. Um, thank you, Becky. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you, Natalie, for uh, having the conversation with us. Um, I would love to be able to continue the conversation uh, potentially in the future with, with more 
of this. We really want to um, strengthen the female voice in the pole vault community as well. Um, and so thank you so much um, for taking some time um, planning this and then also coming on tonight. So thank you ladies for uh, taking the time to do this. Thanks for having us. Thank no you problem. for having I'm also going to give one short plug here for um, my good friend David Butler and his book, The Violent Ballet. You can look him up on Facebook and um, get information from him. And we will be moving um, to July 8th will be our next episode. And we will be having Derek Miles joining us on July 8th. So. Wow. Those of That's you that uh, will be coming, ch chiming in next time, Derek Miles on July well, 8th. So thank you very much. Watched. Yeah, me too. Because I had like 12 people respond to my What Makes a Great Coach saying that Derek Miles is the best coach <laughs> they've ever come across. Natalie, I think can go after Derek too. Like, so thanks for putting us in between there. So, yeah. Yeah. so well, thank you very follow. much. It's fine. <laughs> thank you. Yes, you guys can stay on here just for one second. I'm we're we're done.